Lynch, uh, who's the man leading the strike today for the RMT, is waiting for us at Euston Station. Mr Lynch, good morning to you. It's going to be a busy day for you today. Um, can we just get one thing nailed to the wall before yeah. we get going here? Uh, you've been accused severally in the last few weeks of being a Marxist. It happened again last night. Uh, a backbench Tory MP said you were a Marxist with no interest in anything other than trying to tear down the government. Now, are you or are you not a Marxist? Because if you are a Marxist, then you're into revolution and into bringing down capitalism. So, are you or aren't you? <laughs> Richard, you do come up with the most remarkable twaddle sometimes, I've got I to say. say well, 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 uh, I didn't say you were a Marxist. With, with I'm saying that you're being accused of being a Marxist, and that's not yeah, twaddle. You're that's, me if I'm... that's called reporting. No, I'm not... <laughs> I'm... No, I'm, a, I'm not a Marxist. I'm an elected official of the RMT. I'm a working-class bloke leading a, a trade union dispute about jobs, pay and conditions of service. So it's got nothing to do with Marxism. It's all about this dispute. It's an industrial dispute, yes. and that's what it's all about. Absolutely. I'm, I, I emphasise I am not talking twaddle and accusing you of being a Marxist. I'm merely quoting people who are, including many of the newspapers. Well, that's what it sounds so, like to me. Well, well, I'm sorry if it did, but I don't think it was. Um, but anyway, to be absolutely clear, you are not a Marxist. Fine. Tell us about this letter um, that you saw Fine, last night. I'm also night. not the international centre of evil, which Piers, Cor Piers Morgan calls me the other night. <laughs> All right, I'm leading an industrial dispute, Richard, and I'm trying to get a settlement to it. All right, let, enough of the badinage. Uh, let's get down to, to detail. This letter that you saw last night about redund redundancies, are they voluntary redundancies or mandatory redundancies? They're a statutory notice of redundancy, so they will be compulsory if we can't get an agreement that they're not. So, at the moment, they're the statutory redundancy notice, which is compulsory under law. And has that raised the ante? 2,900 was the number. Yeah. 900. And has that well, raised... it's an escalation of the dispute, isn't it? What? Mm. Carry on. It's an escalation of the dispute, Richard. We went over there last night and they said that we'd get an increased uh, revised pay offer and, uh, and some revisions to what they had on the table. Instead of doing that, they've issued a, a statutory redundancy notice. So that is an escalation of the dispute and makes it harder to get a settlement. But Mick Lynch, you did know that these redundancies were on the table. All you wanted was for it to be ruled out that they would be compulsory. Um, have you got any further in understanding that? Because what the other side is saying, and we, we've got to Network Rail on, is that they believe that they can get the majority of these through voluntary redundancy, given that so many of the workers are over 60, that actually that you're potentially escalating the narrative by suggesting that, you know, that they might all be compulsory, when in fact that isn't the, the case, is it? Well, they might all be compulsory because it's a statutory redundancy notice. That implies compulsory redundancies. That's the way the statute works. It's a, it's a law that was brought in in 1992 by the Tory government. So what we've got here is a situation where they're not offering any guarantee of no compulsory redundancies. They are imposing changes to working practices which will rip up the culture of the railway and rip up the protections that our members have uh, in, in regards to work-life balance, rostering, weekend and night working. And they've also not given us a pay rise, in some cases, on the railway for up to three years. And now, there's a straightforward way to settle that, and the best way to do it is for the government to unshackle the companies so that we can get a settlement. And I'm sure if they did that, I could reach agreement with these companies fairly quickly. But the problem is, of course, that you can't even get the Labour Party on side, at least not publicly. That's a problem for you, isn't it? You, you, you can't get your traditional party who are there, you, you give donations to the Labour Party, how angry are you about that? We, we don't give any do donations to the Labour Party. That's another myth. We are not affiliated to the Labour Party. I'm not a member of the Labour Party. And we have no formal association with them. It's not a problem that we can't get Labour on side. Labour's problem is they can't get working people on side. And they can't get them to vote for them in traditional working class areas. And one of the reasons for that is they're not identifying with working class people who have problems created by low-pay, precarious work and a lack of conditions. So what Keir Starmer and his team need to do is come up with some policies and ideas that connect with working people. I want him to succeed. I want him to be the next Prime Minister. And I want Boris Johnson gone, because he's a disaster for this country and all the people that live in it. If Keir Starmer can do that and connect up with the traditional Labour Party heartlands and the working class base, he will succeed and bring change to this country. But it's up to him how he does that. It'll have no effect whatsoever whether Keir Starmer supports us in this dispute or not. What we need is the support of our members and the support of working-class people in working-class communities. All right, and well, I'm look, sure we're going to get that, because they're all looking for pay rises as well. 
I don't know if you'll, if you'll describe this as twaddle as well, but this is what David Blunkett, uh, former front bencher, of course, uh, said last night, and I quote, I am a lifelong trade unionist. I am proud to belong to one of Britain's largest unions. But to be specific, I believe in modern trade unionism. What I don't believe in is one set of workers knocking seven bells out of another set. So if there is a class war going on, it's sort of within the same class, he's saying. Well, what would you say to, to Mr Blunkett this morning? I'd say he's talking nonsense. Uh, what this is about is our members being threatened. We've got an aggressive attitude from the employers. They're using COVID as a smokescreen. And what David Blunkett ought to do is identify with other workers who need a similar deal to the one that the RMT is campaigning for. We just happen to be at the front and centre of these, of these problems. But the teachers' unions are telling us they're going to uh, campaign. Unison, the health service union and the public services union are telling us they're going to campaign. Even the criminal barristers in this country are going to be having a, a, a strike ballot. So there's something wrong in this society. Uh, wealth is imbalanced. There are super billionaires. There are more rich people than they've ever been. They've never been wealthier. And while we've got full employment, we've got falling real wages. Mm. That has got to be addressed. People are in full-time jobs are taking state benefits and they're having to go to food banks to feed themselves. Now, anyone can work that out. You don't have to be a Marxist or a social scientist to work out that there's a problem at the heart of our society. And it's up to the trade unions to bring back balance and bring back equality to the workplace. And All that's right. what we're part of. All right, Mr. And that's Lynch. what we intend to do. All right. Now, listen, Ranve has a question for you about Grant Chaps in a moment. But just before that, I want to play you something that we had on yesterday's programme. We interviewed live uh, a, a, a professor who's an oncologist, whose job it is to save lives and to extend lives. He treats people with cancer. And this is what he had to say about the effects of the action that your men, are taking to, your men and women are taking today. Oncology services are under a particular breaking point at the moment due to catch up from lockdown and difficulty recruiting, etc. So, this is going to lead to uh, loss of lives. Uh, maybe not now, but in the next uh, few months. He's saying basically that this strike is going to cost lives. People with cancer are going to die, and they wouldn't have done if they'd been able to get their treatment today and later in the week and on Saturday. Well, I don't accept that, and I don't accept that railway workers are the cause of the problems in the oncology departments of hospitals. My own wife is a, an NHS nurse. I've got many friends and family that work in the, in the NHS. And, of course, the NHS is crying out for proper funding. Most of the problems in the NHS are caused by rampant privatisation and profiteering by uh, private sector providers that are currently consuming the NHS. That's now, we don't have to have this dispute. Yeah. This dispute is... This dispute is caused by government policy. And if we can get a settlement for that, we can move the people around, they can get to their appointments, get to the yeah. workplace and, and enjoy their leisure activities. And on that we point, want a settlement as keenly as anyone else. And on that point, you, you mentioned the government... But rail Grant, workers are not killing cancer patients. Would it have made any difference um, to today's strike if Grant Shapps had turned up at the negotiating table? Yes, it would, because he would have to stop uh, telling lies about the situation and start facing reality. Grant Shapps is at the negotiating table, albeit in a form that leaves him to one side on the end of a telephone, on the end of a Zoom call. His officials are dictating the mandate of the train operating companies and Network Rail, and they're doing that actively, and nobody on the management side of the table is denying it. Every time they speak to us, or we put a suggestion to them, they have to leave the room and then go and phone their political bosses uh, in Whitehall. So they may as well get on with it. Either he facilitates uh, a mandate that's going to settle this dispute, or he sends people to the, to the table, his officials or himself, that can settle the dispute directly. So this is all down to him. It's all his responsibility. And he can negotiate with us directly or let the managers get on with it. OK, thank you very much indeed, Mr Lynch. Thank you for your time. Talk to you again, I'm sure. Uh, we also have, of course, uh, the chief executive of uh, Network Rail, Andrew Haynes, coming up. We'll ask him about that letter that they sent last yep. night about the redundancy redundancies uh, and whether that has indeed escalated uh, the problems today. We've also got Grant Shapps, and we'll ask him why he chose not to be first right there at the table in person. But it's interesting, isn't it, Mr Lynch there? Um, everything that everybody says on this, he says, is nonsense, twaddle, and disagrees with every single point that anyone makes.